Welcome to the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. My name is Leon. Let's design an ultralight airplane wing using the FAA method. In previous videos, I've gone over the goals for the UWS Model 1 ultralight airplane design. I've also gone over the airplane configuration for this design, given the mission for the airplane. Now it's time to start working on the more detailed design for the airplane. The first part of the design is going to be figuring out the surface area of the main wing of the airplane. There are pretty much an unlimited number of ways to go about it. We're going to cover two ways to do that in this video and upcoming videos. One of the easiest ways to do that is to use the FAA Advisory Circular 103-7 Appendix 2 method. The FAA really intends that method to be for calculating the stall speed of an airplane given its surface area. We're going to switch it around and assume a stall speed of 24 knots and then calculate the surface area. Let's talk about what the surface area of the wing is. Now you might imagine that the surface area is the total area of the wing, the top surface, the bottom surface, the outside surface of the tips, etc. That's not the surface area we're talking about. That surface area is the wetted surface area. As we go through these videos, you'll notice a lot of terms that are borrowed from the marine and nautical design area. Wetted area is one of those. So imagine a boat setting in the water. All of the surface of the boat touched by the water is a wetted area. In an airplane, all of the surface of the airplane that's touched by the moving air is a wetted area. For our wing size, wetted area is not what we're talking about. So let's talk a little bit more about what surface area is in the design process. If you look over here, this big S is the symbol that we use for surface area. B is the span. Span is the distance from one tip of the wing to the other tip of the wing. C is the cord. The cord is the average distance from the leading edge of the wing to the trailing edge of the wing. And this picture that we have here, this wing is tapered. It's wider in cord at the root than it is at the tip. Since this is a simple tapered wing, the cord of the wing is going to be the distance from the leading edge to the trailing edge right in the middle of one half of the wing. I'm going to be using imperial units on this design. For surface area then, we will have units of square feet. Span will be in feet. Cord will typically be in inches, but we'll convert to feet for our calculation. As I mentioned before, the FAA has a method that they approve for just simply calculating the stall speed of an ultralight without having to actually demonstrate it. You can find that in the FAA Advisory Circular 103-7 in Appendix 2. And there are four steps to this method. The first method is you have to calculate the weight of the ultralight, and they have certain limitations and caveats for calculating the weight. Knowing the weight of the ultralight and you also have to previously know the surface area, you can calculate the wing loading. You also in step three determine the lift factor for the wing as a whole, which is similar to a lift coefficient for an airfoil. And once you have the wing loading and lift factor, determine the stall speed by looking it up on a little graph. Now if you want to get more of the details of this method, I put a URL here on this slide that you can look up and read exactly what those details are. Since we are designing an ultralight, we don't yet know what the surface area is going to be. So we have to switch these steps around a little bit and assume that we're going to use a maximum stall speed of 24 knots, which is from the part 103 regulations. And knowing that, then we can work backwards to the surface area. Since the Appendix 2 method expects you to already know the wing surface area, we need to switch our order of operations around. 
First thing we would do is determine the lift factor using the same method as in Appendix 2. Then using their chart, the lift factor, and our expected stall speed of 24 knots, we can determine the wing loading. We will then calculate the weight of the ultralight using the same method as in Appendix 2. With the wing loading and weight, we can then calculate the surface area of the wing. There is another term we need to talk about before we get into our calculations for the wing size, and that's the wing flaps. This cutaway that I have up here at the top gives a profile view of an airfoil. It's as though we had cut the wing and we are looking at it from the side. Back here at the trailing edge of the airfoil, I have a flap. This dotted line is where the flap normally is during cruise flight. I have it tilted down 30 degrees roughly in this picture, which is where you might have it when you're trying to land. This particular style of flap that I'm showing is a plane flap. And for our calculations, a plane flap is just fine. In a future video, we'll get into more elaborate flaps. In determining the lift factor, we need to know how much of the wing span has wing flaps. So I've drawn two different views here. The appendix two wants to know if you have less than 50% flaps or more than 50% flaps. I've drawn a dotted line here at the 50% mark of this wing, and then I've drawn in some flaps here. Obviously, these flaps are occupying less than 50% of the wing. We've got some fuselage here where there are no flaps, and we have a engine pylon underneath where I have no flaps. And we don't even make it out to the 50% mark. So this is clearly less than 50% flaps. On the other side, I've just extended that outer flap a little bit so we're easily beyond the 50% mark, and we've more than made up for the fuselage and the engine pylon area. So this would be more than 50% flaps. Another term we need to talk about that is used in Appendix 2 to determine the lift factor is camber. First, we'll describe what Appendix 2 expects camber to be. Section 2 expects camber to be the difference between the top surface of your airfoil and the cord line. You take that height and divide by the cord line, and that will give you camber. Let's say your cord line is 100 inches and you have 7 inches between the cord line and the top surface, that would be a 7% camber. So that's the method we'll use for, to determine camber for Appendix 2. But that is not the normal definition of camber. The normal definition of camber is a line running from the leading edge back toward the trailing edge, but halfway between the bottom surface and the top surface of the airfoil. This solid blue line then is the camber line. To determine the camber from the camber line, then you take the difference between the cord line and the camber line, in this case I've used an F to show that, and then you divide by the cord line. And of course you multiply by 100 to get a percentage. If this was 7 inches, that would then be a 7% camber if our cord line was 100 inches. But like I said for Appendix 2, we'll use the top curve as our camber line. Now it is time to determine the lift factor for our wing. As we get into some future videos talking about lift coefficient, we'll find out that the lift factor that the FAA is using in Appendix 2 of Advisory Circular 103-7 is really the lift of coefficient for the wing as a whole. We have a choice of four lift factors. The lowest lift factor of 1.4 is used for cambered wings, either single surface or double surface, if the camber is less than 7%. It's also used for symmetrical airfoils or airfoils that are close to symmetrical. The next lift factor we have to choose from is 1.6. This lift factor is for airfoils that have a roughly flat bottom, uh, are double surface, and have a camber of more than 7%. The next 
The next lift factor is 1.8. This is a little more complicated. This is for airfoils. If they are single surface that have more than 7% camber, or for double sided airfoils that have flaps up to 50% of the wingspan. The next lift factor we have available and last is 2.0. This is for double surface airfoils that have flaps that extend more than 50% of the wingspan. For our new design, the UWS-1, we're going to choose a double-sided airfoil. That's because double-sided airfoils have less drag than the single surface airfoils. We're also going to put flaps in that are more than 50% of the wingspan. And that's so that we can get a higher lift coefficient. So using the FA method, we get to use a lift factor of 2.0. When we get to the next video talking about using analytical methods for calculating our lift coefficient of the wing, we'll find out that we can actually get a larger than 2.0 lift coefficient. Next, we determine the wing loading. The chart that you see here on the left side of the screen was originally intended to be used in step four of appendix two of air circular 103-7. The way the FAA intended for this chart to be used is that you will have already calculated your wing loading using the aircraft weight and the surface area. You would then come down here to this x-axis where your wing loading is. In this example, they have it at 2.8 pounds per square foot. You would then travel up to your lift factor line. Let's say it's 1.6. Then you come over to the left to find out what the stall speed would be for that wing. We're going to use this chart backwards. We already know our stall speed, which would be the maximum allowed from part 103 of 24 knots. We know that our lift factor is 2.0 from the previous slide. So we'll go from 24 knots over 2.0, and then we'll come down to our wing loading. So our wing loading is 3.92 pounds per square foot. Our next step is to determine the weight of the ultralight. We'll start with the empty weight of 254 pounds. That is the maximum weight allowed for an empty ultralight. Empty meaning no fuel, no objects that are easily removed from the aircraft like seat cushions, etc. Some things that are attached to the aircraft can be ignored in the empty weight. One example is a full plane parachute. You're allowed to ignore up to 24 pounds for the parachute. Another thing that can be ignored are floats or a floating hull up to a limit, but we don't have that for this aircraft, so we're going to ignore that. We also need to add in the weight of a pilot. The FAA allows you to use a standard weight for a pilot of 170 pounds. So if we add our empty weight of 254, a pilot weight of 170, we have zero for fuel, we have zero for floats, and zero for parachute. Our grand total for the airplane weight is 424 pounds. We have now reached the last step for calculating the surface area of the wing. We calculate our surface area by dividing the weight, 424 pounds, by the wing loading, 392 pounds per square foot. And we get 108 square feet for the surface area of our wing. If you look at Appendix 2 of AC 103-7, you'll note that they say that this method for calculating the surface area, or for them, the stall speed, is only applicable for a rectangular shaped wing. So it does not apply to a swept wing or a tapered wing. On this ultralight, we want to use a tapered wing so we can have a more efficient wing, which means a wing with less drag. So we're going to have to go through a detailed analysis to obtain our surface area, where we can take into account taper and or sweep. I've created a slide here that has a spreadsheet that does all the previously described calculations, steps one through four. As you can see over here on the right-hand column, we have our lift factor of two, and we've gone through the calculation, and we have a wing surface area of 108 square feet. 
I've also done the calculation for a flip factor of 1.8, where we have flaps extending for under 50% of the span, the over 7% camber, and the under 7% camber with a lift factor of 1.4. So you can see down here for the lift factor of 1.4, we have a wing area of 155 square feet. So with no flaps and a small camber, it takes quite a bit of surface area when we're stalling at 24 knots. And just for grins to kind of get a better idea what the dimensions of the wing would be for the surface area, I've selected a wingspan of 30 feet all across. And then we divide our surface area by the 30 feet and then convert to inches. And we have what the mean cord would be for the wing. So going back to our original lift factor of 2, we have a cord of 43 inches. And at the other end, with the lift factor of 1.4, we have a cord of 62 inches. To get a little bit of an idea of how thick the wing will be from top to bottom, with a thickness to cord ratio of 15%, we would then have a thickness of 6.5 inches with the lift factor of 2. We have a wing thickness of 9.3 inches with the lift factor of 1.4. Now one of the consequences of wing thickness is going to be how heavy or how strong the spar has to be. The six and a half inch spar is going to have to be built much stronger than the 9.3 inch spar. And we'll get into the beam design in a later video. The next thing to do is going to be to use the analytical method for calculating these values. And we've got some references that we'll use for that. We'll talk about in the next video.